feel like doing a big round of applause for Tony, um, who is here with us and we'll get to um, hear more live. But a warm welcome to everybody. Um, welcome across our Zoom channels, across YouTube. A warm welcome and uh, thank you to Tony. Um, we know that you're saying hello and putting your locations in the Zoom chats and in the YouTube comments. Please continue to do so, introduce yourselves um, and begin connecting. At any time, as you know, you can open the participants section in your uh, Zoom room and be able to connect with each other. Um, it is wonderful to see you all here. Uh, my name is Antoinette and I am one of the hosts of our Gaia journey. It is a joy to be here with you from New York um, today. And um, we have been in quite a journey together. Um, I have the great joy of introducing um, Otto, who will introduce Fritav Capra, who's with us today. Um, and we'll go to them in just a, a few minutes. Um, but we will just share a little bit about um, where we've been. So for those of you who haven't been with us before, if it's your first time um, here with us on the Gaia journey, then welcome to you. Um, and for those of you who have been with us week after week, we are in week nine. Um, it is wonderful to have you with us again. Um, and to just help us land into where we are now, um, I'll share a little bit about um, the journey itself and who we are and where we're going. Um, so I'll just share a few slides here for us. Um, so welcome to the Gaia journey. Um, and this is our inhale moment. So in each um, experience, each week, we have an inhale and exhale. And really what this does is it allows us to just kind of drop into sensing our own experience and the experience of the collective. So each week for the inhales, we've been joined by about 7,000 people. Um, so while you're in a Zoom room right now that, say, that says you're somewhere around 200 people in each room or the YouTube channel, um, each of those are threaded together. So the Zoom rooms are threaded together and we'll be able to hear across uh, all the Zoom rooms and we're streaming out to, to YouTube. Um, so throughout the day, we've held uh, sessions in English um, and Spanish and Portuguese, and then other languages have continued throughout the week. Together, we are uh, over 70 countries and um, representing uh, also over seven language groups. So um, those language groups have been taking off and um, bringing their communities together in all sorts of different ways that um, can be cross-cultural and really cross-pollinating across our global community. So um, that is what we've been doing in our inhale sessions. Um, and during our inhale and exhale rhythm that you see here, we're sort of letting one um, way of being or one world, if you will, um, we're letting some pieces of that go. And together we're, we're sensing into what is wanting to be born, what is emerging for us. Um, and so that is just a, a beautiful depiction of our journey of the inhale and exhale. And each week we've been moving through, many of us have been um, connecting with each other in social solidarity circles um, or with our own communities or context or with our own practice, maybe going in nature in whatever way we can, connecting in with our own um, breath, our own experience in the body. And we've been using different tools like the social solidarity circle 1.0 and 2.0 and 3.0 will be coming out uh, over this weekend. So as you um, have been experiencing that, we've been kind of moving in this rhythm together. We started on March 27th and now we're here on May 22nd. And I don't know about all of you, but I am um, still trying to remember the day and the dates um, that, that we're in each day. And it just feels like each day, each week, there's something new emerging um, in, in our communities. Um, and we will collectively move towards the Global Forum on July 10th and 11th. Um, with a couple more inhales um, and the exhale sessions that you each are holding and hosting in your own communities. Um, this experience, this journey um, has been framed by Theory U and, and presencing work, um, which has been built over decades. Um, but these, we'll call them, you know, these kind of tri-sections, um, 
they've been following this you process of staying with, so deep listening and dialogue um, in that first few weeks, and then dropping into a deep resonance of just kind of hearing what was what we're seeing and sensing and then dropping in and connecting to source. Um, and we move towards this kind of moving with, so moving into action um, and vertical social prototyping, which we'll discuss in the upcoming inhale sessions. Um, but for now, we're sitting on this paradigm shift. So this moment in time where we're moving from what we knew um, into something new that we may not uh, know yet, may not be prepared for, um, but we have maybe been preparing all our lives. So um, we are moving into that paradigm shift together. And, um, and that is what we will be experiencing today with, uh, with Otto and with Fritav Capra who um, are joining us today. Um, or Fridoff who's joining us today. So thank you all for joining. It is um, wonderful to be together. I'll give us just a couple, uh, before we go over to Otto, just a couple of um, just reminders or highlights for those of us who haven't been here um, in, the, in the journey that, as I said, we kind of shared everything that I've gone through in my life has prepared me for this moment. That actually came up in our first session on March 27th. Um, and then we've had many guests joining us throughout this experience, which has given us little highlights and glimpses um, to deep bodies of work and um, profound experiences across the globe. So we had Vandana Shiva share with us that the new colonization is the colonization of the mind. We also had Dana Cunningham sharing with us that structural violence is actually a set of human agreements. Um, and that, you know, as we see these disparities of how people are being affected all over the world, I know particularly in the United States, um, that we can shift those agreements by, by actually starting to see them, that they are there. Um, we had Noel Nanup from the Aboriginal um, community in Western Australia. Um, he's an elder and he, sh he shared, all we need to do is have the piece of the path to the future that's ours and tend to that piece of the path. And we explored how, you know, so wonderful that we have these, these guests and the sharing and, and then we have to actually explore, okay, how do we practice it? How do we do this? Um, so we've used the methods and tools of presencing um, and sensing into the body. We've used social presencing theater and dove into our own experience there and looked at the micro shifts that are already happening. Two weeks ago, we had Thomas Hubel, who really explored integrating the parts of us that are fragmented. First, becoming aware that when trauma happens as individuals or as a collective, we sort of put it outside of ourselves and uh, maybe make it into our past. And that our work now is seeing and accepting that as reality, and then maybe beginning to move that into wholeness. We had Nipun Mehta, who opened our hearts and moved us into compassionate action, um, seeing that from around the world. In our Spanish and Portuguese tracks, um, we had the, in the Spanish track, Alejandro Corks, who said, what you like and don't, they both hold a marvelous secret to one's freedom. And we had um, Ubirachi Patakso, who shared, we need to be the system. Um, and John Kabat-Zinn, who reminded us about waking up fully. So we're becoming aware of the ways that we actually are the system. We're becoming more aware in ourselves and in the, the collective. Um, and we just had Peter Senge join us and remind us that we need to unlearn and also connect up our individual experience to that of the collective um, to take awareness-based action. So with that little reminder, I now send it over to you, Otto, for further framing of, of where we're going. Thank you, Antoinette, and uh, hello, everyone. And before we move into um, the, the breakout groups to share a little bit your experience of the past two weeks and uh, where you are now, uh, I just want to double click on what um, Antoinette said in terms of methodology. So what we really try to do here, as you know, is leaning into the current moment with our mind and heart wide open. Um, so, um, which means kind of with really accessing our, our curiosity, compassion, and uh, courage. And in the first uh, few weeks, we have been more focusing on the left-hand side here, the seeing and sensing and, and making sense of deep listening. 
And with this session, we are really beginning to move into this direction here, the crystallizing, kind of crystallizing vision and intention and focusing more on what it is uh, that we want to bring um, into reality partic with a particular focus on, uh, on uh, the paradigm shift uh, we are um, we, we feel is, is necessary. And when you look at the bigger picture today, kind of our current situation, we really see these two responses. Um, one is kind of that's depicted here, responses to the COVID-19 situation, the pandemic. So one is down here. Um, when you remember uh, Nippon Meta last time and also John Kabat-Zinn, they talked about really the power of, and many of us really made, made reference for you now this, um, uh, uh, this phenomenon of an outpouring of compassionate uh, action kind of uh, awareness-based compassionate action uh, with a lot of, uh, uh, you know, courage, you know, being activated around that. That's, that's one phenomenon. But then Thomas Hubel also helped us to see this other part here, kind of there is this other response too. And that has to do with it's too much, right? With closing down, with a freeze reaction of the mind, heart, will, aka ignorance, hate, and fear. And um, as Thomas, um, you know, and you know, uh, you know, deciphering and reading collective trauma helped us to see. So the denial is really the not seeing, right? What's down here? The desensing really is not feeling. And then, and as we uh, move into the absencing, it's the disconnect from our highest future possibility, and. That results in blaming others in violence. Remember Dana talking about structural violence and uh, how it's showing up in our life right now, and eventually self-destruction. So if you step back and say, okay, so how are we as a system responding to the current situation, whether we respond by moving into this cycle here, or whether we respond by moving into this cycle, which is connecting with reality more deeply, has real life consequences, right? And in the US, um, um, that number, the number of, uh, you know, a death through the uh, COVID-19 situation will hit 100,000 probably by Monday or so. So it has real life consequences. And um, from a viewpoint of awareness-based systems change, uh, we can say that experience is not what happens to us, but what we do with what happens to us. So whether we respond to uh, you know, what happens to us from uh, uh, an inner place that's grounded in this reality down here, or whether we, we respond from a freeze and being overwhelmed um, reaction. And uh, the same way we can say that the future is not what happens to us, but what we do with what happens to us. So whether we are able to rise to the occasion by being grounded in this reality down here, or in, in this inner place down here, or whether we respond, you know, by an inner place that is more shaped by these other characteristics. So the question really is for us, how do we strengthen our capacity to access kind of these deeper levels of uh, operating? both as an individual, but also on a collective level. Because what we see is an, uh, in the world today is an amplification of this upper cycle here. So what is our response there also on the level of the collective? And that's, so what does that take? And what we believe what it takes is, among others, innovations in infrastructures on three different levels, learning, democracy, and the economy. So new learning infrastructures, uh, with that, we really mean whole person, whole systems ways of, of, of operating. And, you know, the, the Gaia journey in itself is, is you know, a little example in that direction, right? And many of us are involved already in these initiatives. New democratic infrastructures really means making democracy more participatory, more direct, distributed, dialogic. And new economic infrastructures really means helping us to shift the fundamental logic, how our economic institutions and our economic actions are organized from ego system awareness 
to something that could be called ecosystem awareness, by which we mean an awareness that is focusing on the well-being um, of all. So that's a little bit kind of the uh, the backdrop in terms of the uh, methodology and the bigger picture in which kind of our conversation uh, is taking place. Uh, and with that, we'll move into uh, Antoinette will move us into the um, uh, check-in conversations. Thank you, Otto. Um, so we will move into the check-in conversation just to get a pulse of where are you in this journey? Um, where are you sitting now? So you'll move into groups of about four or five for eight minutes. So you'll have about two minutes each to share. Um, so it's really just a light touch on sharing your name and uh, where you currently are. And lately we've been kind of there have been new pieces of us opening. So for um, our last inhale session, Otto shared about organs of perception. So one of the questions is, what new organ of perception is opening within you? What have you been feeling in the last few weeks? And um, as you do that, you'll just continue to um, share with one another. Also, what intention is beginning to clarify for you? So in addition to what organ of perception is opening, what intention is beginning to clarify for you? It may be that it's not clear yet, um, that it has nothing to do with your original intention of when you initially signed up um, or clicked in. So again, your name, where you currently are, um, what new organ of perception is opening for you and what intention you may have. Um, so we will place you into breakouts just now and um, encourage you to really just genuinely listen to each other um, from a deeper place than just here, kind of dropping into deeper listening and enjoy the time together. We'll see you back here in eight minutes.
So I know we're just coming back. So if you're joining us on YouTube, I know you've been there. <laughs> um, and you can begin uh, sharing in the comments if you were journaling. Um, and regardless, we will be all coming back in just a moment together on Zoom. Um, so the whole group, so about 40 seconds, we, we should all be back in. And I hope you all had a wonderful conversation. And if you do start sharing on uh, YouTube, it would be great to hear some of your current intentions um, or what new organ of perception is opening. And we'll try to get some of those uh, comments shared in here as well. All right, it looks like everybody is back. Welcome back, everybody. Welcome from your uh, Zoom chats. Welcome back on YouTube. Um, we are, we'd love to just hear what has come up for you. And we really want to move to Fritoff also, and we'll have more time for actual harvesting and sharing across the uh, audio as well. So for now, let's um, just share in the chat. Um, and if you want to stay connected with your group, if you haven't formed a social solidarity circle yet, um, you can private message um, those people with um, using the participants function and clicking on their name and chatting directly to them. Um, so again, please share anything that's come up around your organ of perception that's opening or your intention that's your that you're holding. And uh, I'll share a few of the comments from the chat just so that we can move into the Fritoff conversation. Um, and we'll make sure that we hear voices and see the visual across all Zoom rooms uh, later in the session. So just hear from uh, channel one that um, open heart has come up. An open heart came up earlier in the in the first session as well. Um, eyes wide open has come up. The organ is heart, the intention is not yet clear. And that is perfectly okay too. Um, I think we are really ready for the change we are looking for. Listening for me also. I've had these ears for years, but never really used them. Images as a learning meaning sensor and imagination as a reflective lens. Nature is what is re-emerging. Inner looking is my new organ in all caps. The courage not to be understood. Intention based on Adrian Marie Brown's emergent strategy, being seen in all my needs and capacities is imperative to interdependence and collaboration. Softer heart, softer skin, but thicker heart and skin as well, awakening to that duality. These are beautiful. My heart is feeling more, intention of doing the work I love. Paying attention to the subtle energies in the body when I pause as a source of wisdom. Thank you all, these are fantastic and please, um, Feel free to keep sharing in the chat, but for this moment, I'd like to turn it over to Otto um, to bring us into dialogue with Rita. Thank you so much. So it's a real uh, uh, pleasure and privilege to introduce you uh, to Fritjof of Capra. Uh, Fritjof doesn't need um, in this community any uh, uh, introduction. He's physicist, uh, system theorist, uh, and author of a number of really influential books, The Tao of Physics, uh, Turning Point, The Web of Life, among others. And uh, Fritjof, I, um, I still remember when I was, um, I, when I just came out of high school um, back uh, then in Germany, must have been 1982 or something like that. I remember reading your back then, uh, I think Turning Point, uh, that book was just published. Uh, and I remember not only reading it and excerpting it, but uh, going around in my networks and uh, among my friends and giving lectures about that, regardless whether people wanted to hear it or not. I mean, um, 
some things remain the same. But uh, so so I was really in it. So the reason why I did that was because it was an illuminating experience for me. Because reading that book, um, what connected with me. Uh, being an activist back, back then in the green movement, uh, but also around some social issue move, uh, movements uh, like the, the peace movement and so on, and interested in the deeper dimensions of consciousness, what I felt was really missing, uh, missing and what was kind of lacking or like a, an issue we had from a movement building point of view is the following thing, which is that the movement that in reality is one, has been split into different pieces. One part of it focusing on the environmental issues, and then you have single issues on the social realm, and then you have the whole consciousness or new age movement going off in yet another direction, often disconnected to the other ones. So what I always felt is the social, the, the ecological, and the spiritual, kind of the, the deeper uh, connecting to our deeper sources dimensions are not separate, that they're, they're like uh, different parts, different windows, uh, angles of, of the same larger thing. And that's what I found in your book. That's why it had such a profound impact on me, because... Uh, for the first time, I really saw these dimensions integrated. Um, and so that, you know, that, that opened up a new organ of, I would say, perception and aspiration within myself that I have been following uh, ever since. So um, a very warm welcome, Fritjof. And yeah, yeah. so I want to uh, open up with a question, given this um, uh, context, What's your take? You have been, you know, you have seen the 1970s, that you have been really one of the main sources of inspiration for part of that movement back then. And you, you then you saw the 80s, 90s, and the current moment. What do you see going on? Um, uh, and um, how this issue of kind of being split apart in different, you know, aspects of the movement and how they may be reintegrated or not, how do you look back and how do you look at the current moment, yeah. given that deeper question? Well, th thank you, Otto, for this very nice introduction. And uh, I never knew that you were so active in promoting my, my book, The Turning Point, in Germany. Uh, this book, which uh, in the German edition is called Wendezeit, The Turning Time, uh, became a huge bestseller in 1983. And so now I know uh, who was behind this, uh, Otto Sharma. Not true, not true at all. No, no, I was just <laughs> one of many, many, many who, who yeah. caught up on that. No, but, but, but thank you. And I would say, uh, you know, looking back, as you asked me to do, I would actually start with the 1960s. I'm a few years older than you. And so I, uh, I remember not only the 70s, but the 60s, I think, where it all started because they were, there were a whole series of cultural movements that um, uh, seemed to go toward an expansion of consciousness in two directions, into the spiritual direction and into the social and political direction. And both happened in the 1960s. In the 1960s, uh, these movements and, and, you know, for those of our uh, viewers and participants uh, who haven't lived during this time, which is uh, most of you, I imagine, um, I, should, I should mention that the 60s were not only uh, the student movements and the Prague Spring and uh, the civil rights movement in the United States, they uh, were also, uh, you know, the films of Jean-Luc Godard and Antonioni and Fellini, uh, the uh, freedom of a new theater, of a new uh, literary framework, which in France was called the Nouveau Roman, the new novel, uh, and just uh, novelty everywhere. And um, uh, in, in a sense, uh, triggered by a very thorough questioning of authority. 
the authority of men over women, of, of white people over black people, of the Russians over you know, the communist bloc, of psychotherapists over their patients, and so on and so on. So this was a very broad movement which uh, arose in uh, various parts of the world and was driven by a very strong intuition that another world is possible. This, this slogan did not exist in the 60s, but it describes it very well, that we felt there is an alternative reality. It was called the counterculture, and um, we didn't have a framework for it. We, we, we were protesting, we were forming our alternative communities like Woodstock and so on. Uh, we had, we had, you know, uh, art, the arts that unified us, you know, and, you know, if you wish, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And so there was an, a new sexual freedom, there was experimentation with psychedelics, and, you know, rock music, free jazz, and so on, uh, formed a, a unifying artistic framework. Then in the 1970s, there were two movements, the feminist movement and the uh, ecology movement, which gave us a framework. In the 1980s, the green movement was the first unification, uh, which uh, gave uh, this, uh, these movements uh, a political dimension. And uh, then we went into the 90s, where there was a huge disruption with the information technology revolution the new global economy, which caused a lot of harm. And it took us a decade to recover from that. And, you know, now we are going on. I don't want to go on any longer, but that's sort of, uh, you know, my, my view. And, and I was fortunate to be in the right place at the right time. And my book, The Turning Point, published in 98, was the first formulation of what I already at that time called the systems view of life. And I then spent 30 years um, uh, developing a synthesis of a new conception of life that has emerged in science. And uh, the, the definitive, my definitive synthesis is published in a textbook called actually The Systems View of Life, co-authored with Pierluigi Luisi and published by Cambridge University Press. And that is the uh, basis of an online course I'm teaching which is called the Systems View of Life, or for PR reasons, Capra course, so you, that you can e easily find it on the internet. So, so that's what I've been doing in the last 30 years. Um, but um, what I want to share today uh, is a systemic analysis of the COVID pandemic. And I don't know when to start with that. Or yeah, well, uh, I, I think uh, it would be wonderful if you could start with that in a moment. But could you, before you jump into that, could you give us the essence of, you know, what clarified for you the system's view? Because uh, that might that might be really helpful and maybe also teeing up the, the session we have later today with Umberto. So. So what is, um, so what was it that clarified for you and that what you kind of um, published there as the essence? What, what are the, the key um, essentials of that? Well, uh, the, the essence uh, did not emerge for me in the 1980s. Uh, the, the systems view of life that I described uh, in the turning point was something that I patched together from various sides. You know, I, I uh, had discussions with Gregory Bateson and I, I knew uh, the work of Ilya Prigozhin. I did not know the work of Maturana and Varela at that time. Uh, I knew about uh, the Gaia, th no, I did not know about the Gaia theory, not yet. So, so it was a sort of mosaic of, you know, self-organization. That's the term that I focused on. But, but now from hindsight, you know, from, from the present looking back, I would say that the very essence of the system's view of life is a fundamental change of metaphors from seeing the world as a machine 
to understanding it as a network. So this change from machine to network. A network, as everybody knows, is a certain pattern of links, a pattern of relationships. And therefore, to think in terms of networks and to understand networks, we need to think in terms of patterns and relationships. And that's what systemic thinking or systems thinking is all about. So uh, now we know that uh, you know, they're not only the social networks we all live in, but there are ecological networks, there are biological networks, there are molecular networks. Wherever we see life, we see networks. That, that's uh, the very essence of it, I think. So when you apply that essence onto the current situation, wh what do you see? Well, that, that uh, requires some uh, laying out. And if, if, you, if you don't mind, I, I will take 15, 20 minutes to do that. We will have to hear that. OK. So um, as you all know, the coronavirus has resulted in a um, massive disruption of our daily lives and is likely to have historic political and social consequences. So I would like to share with you a systemic analysis of the corona pandemic, which means, as I just said, an analysis in terms of relationships and patterns, an analysis that shows how the various aspects and dimensions of the pandemic are all interrelated. In my view, the coronavirus must be seen as a biological response of Gaia, our living planet, to the ecological and social emergency that humanity has brought upon itself. It arose from an ecological imbalance and has dramatic consequences because of social and economic imbalances. During the last decades of the 20th century, humanity exceeded the Earth's carrying capacity, which means the number of people the biosphere can support without environmental degradation. World population has grown to 7.8 billion, and the irrational obsession of our political and corporate leaders with perpetual economic and corporate growth on a finite planet has created a multifaceted existential crisis, threatening the very extinction of human civilization. Well, scientists and environmental activists, among many others, have warned about the dire consequences of our unsustainable social, economic, and political systems for decades. But until now, our corporate and political leaders unable to break their intoxication with financial profits and political power, stubbornly resisted these warnings, focusing their attention on short-term economic and political fluctuations. They disregarded the impending catastrophic long-term consequences. Now, however, our political and financial elites are forced to pay attention as the COVID pandemic brought the earlier warnings into real time. The clear cutting of large areas of tropical rainforest by multinational food corporations, relentlessly pursuing excessive growth and profits, as well as massive intrusions into other ecosystems around the world, have fragmented these self-regulating systems and have fractured the web of life. Among the many consequences of these destructive activities was one that um, viruses which had lived in symbiosis with certain animal species where they did no harm, now in the fractured environment, jumped from those species to other animals and to humans where they are toxic or even deadly. So in the 1960s, an obscure virus 
jump from a rare species of monkeys in West Africa to humans. From there, it migrated to the United States where it was identified as the HIV virus and caused the AIDS pandemic, which killed an estimated 39 million people over four decades. Similarly, the coronavirus jumped from a species of bats in China to humans and from there rapidly spread around the world. Now, in this spread of infections, population density is the key variable. And population density, and you see here, this is where systemic thinking comes in. Population density is often a consequence of excessive profit maximizing, whether we talk about giant cruise ships or other forms of mass tourism, giant supermarkets, meatpacking plants, or crowded living conditions caused by uh, economic and social inequality. Ecology has taught us that maximizing a single variable will invariably lead to stress and vulnerability of the system as a whole. In previous times, these vulnerable social and cultural conditions were usually concealed by the corporate media. But now the coronavirus, which does not know any social or cultural boundaries, has laid them open. The role of social justice in a pandemic is a very interesting topic and another example of how you can apply systems thinking. You see, in normal times, the rich are relatively isolated from the poor. They live in their own neighborhoods, they have their own schools, hospitals, restaurants, clubs, and so on. And so the fate of the poor does not affect them directly. During a pandemic like COVID-19, the situation changes dramatically. Since the virus does not know any social boundaries, the fate of the poor can no longer be separated from that of the rich. Because of crowded living conditions, lack of access to clean water, and especially in the United States, inadequate health care and social protection, the poor are much more susceptible from being affected by the pandemic. And that's what the statistics show. There are disproportionately uh, high numbers uh, of infections and deaths among min minorities. But sooner or later, the poor will also infect the rich because although they are socially separated, they are not biologically separated. You see, there are numerous physical contacts between the rich and their personal assistants, drivers, delivery services, cleaning and maintenance staff, and so on. And through these physical contacts, the virus propagates regardless of social class. So during a pandemic, this is what we need to conclude. Social justice is no longer a political issue between left and right, but becomes an issue of life and death. To prevent the spread of pandemics, now and in the future, it will be essential to improve the living conditions of the poor. More generally, we can say that ethical behavior, that is behavior for the common good, be uh, becomes a, an issue of life and death during a pandemic. Because a pandemic like COVID-19 can only be overcome by collective cooperative actions. Well, similar considerations, again, from a systemic perspective, apply to world population growth. Demographers have long known that the most effective means of curbing population growth is the education of girls and enhancing the role and status of women around the world, ensuring their access to economic and political power, and safeguarding their reproductive rights. 
once again, we see that social justice goes hand in hand with ecological balance. Well, when the pandemic spread around the world, as you know, country after country went into lockdown with only essential businesses remaining open and most people being confined to their homes as we still largely are. As a consequence, the transportation of people and goods was radically reduced, supply chains were disrupted, businesses closed, the stock market collapsed, and unemployment soared. So the worldwide health crisis went hand in hand with a worldwide economic crisis. Both of these crises have led to widespread tragic consequences for individuals and communities around the world. However, from a planetary ecological perspective, there have also been a lot of very good consequences. As automobile traffic and industrial activities decrease dramatically, the pollution of major cities has suddenly disappeared. And once again, we can enjoy clear skies and clean air. Wildlife is flourishing in ecosystems undisturbed by humans. As giant cruise ships no longer enter the Venetian lagoon and other tourists stay at home, the canals of Venice have become so clear that fish can be seen again. In India, Residents of Punjab are now able to enjoy a stunning view of the Himalayas, 2,000 km, 200 kilometers away, which they have not seen for 30 years because of the pollution. The coronavirus has already been more effective in reducing CO2 emissions and slowing down the climate breakdown than all the world's policy initiatives combined. Now, this does not mean that we want to go on living in our present condition. You see, the current environmental regeneration has been the result of radically reduced human activities. The same positive effects could be achieved, not by radically reducing, but by radically changing our human activities. The world's COVID response has shown us what is possible when people realize that their lives are at stake, either individual in the current pandemic or for civilization as a whole in the climate crisis. We know now that the world is able to respond with urgency and coherence once the political will has been aroused. With the COVID pandemic, Gaia has presented us with valuable life-saving lessons. The question is, will we have the wisdom and the political will to heed these lessons? And will we apply them to the climate crisis? Will we shift from undifferentiated, extractive economic growth to regenerative qualitative growth? Will we replace fossil fuels with renewable forms of energy for all our energy needs? Will we stop excessive mass tourism and instead revitalize local communities? Will we replace our centralized energy intensive system of industrial agriculture with organic, community-oriented, regenerative farming? Will we plant billions of trees to draw down CO2 from the atmosphere and restore the world's ecosystems so that viruses dangerous to humans are confined again to the animal species where they do no harm? Today, we have the knowledge and the technologies to embark on all these uh, initiatives. Will we have the political will? Well, 
the answer, my friend, is blowing in the wind, to quote Bob Dylan. However, what we see already is that corresponding social policies, which were unthinkable just a couple of months ago, are now being discussed seriously in various countries. For example, Denmark is planning to pay 75% of the salaries lost by employees in private companies to help them through the crisis. The UK similar, similarly plans to cover 80% of salaries. In the United States, the idea of a basic universal income, which was always considered a fringe idea, is now seriously discussed, even by Republican politicians. Spain is nationalizing its private hospitals. California is leasing hotels to shelter the homeless during the pandemic. The Green New Deal, already endorsed previously by some Democratic presidential candidates, is now being discussed in the mainstream as a program of economic recovery. If we can catalyze global leadership to continue such social policies, and if we can add to them policies that respect and cooperate with nature's inherent ability to sustain life, we may not only overcome the COVID pandemic, but also we may succeed in stabilizing world population and the climate, nurturing local communities, and restoring the Earth's ecosystem. We may see CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere return to the safe level of 350 parts per million. And we may see climate catastrophes become rare as they were in previous centuries. Looking back on 2020, future historians may conclude that even though the COVID pandemic had widespread tragic consequences for individuals and communities around the world, in the long run, it may have saved humanity and large parts of the community of life from extinction. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Fritjof, for um, applying the uh, living systems view onto the uh, current situation. And um, also making us aware of how many um, of these uh, turning point stories, right? The, uh, the universal basic un income here in the US or all the things that are now going on and being launched in Europe. So how, uh, how much of that is already either in discussion or already being prototyped on a smaller scale? Yeah. And, and then, often, you know, look, you and then making sense of the current situation uh, from the future. Yeah. So, and may, I, may I say uh, that what strikes me most is that every day now we see changes that should have happened a long time ago yeah. and now are forced by the pandemic. For instance, meatpacking plants should never have existed. This whole factory farming should never have existed. And, and you know, uh, bicycle paths and going for walks with, with your children or grandchildren uh, sh should be something that we practice because it's community enhancing, it's healthy, it's good for the environment and so on. And all of these things are now forced uh, on us by this pandemic. That's why I say it's it's Gaia's response. Gaia's response and teaching us um, some uh, life-saving lessons, um, as you as as you put it. Right. With that, I, I turn it over to you, uh, Antoinette, and also to Tony to lead us into a moment of uh, contemplation and reflection before we go into the breakout groups. Beautiful. So um, we 
are just at the top of the hour. And um, in this moment, I'd like to just give us a moment of stillness and just settle into what is resonating for you now. Um, and to do that, perhaps to find a sense of rootedness to Gaia, um, not just the Gaia journey that we are experiencing on our screen, but to Earth um, and to what she may have for us. So the invitation as we move into this moment of stillness um, is that Tony will play for us um, you, if you feel called to journal and you don't want to just stay in stillness and you need to write, that is absolutely wonderful as well. Um, but really just tapping into what is here for us. What is Gaia teaching us from this moment? Um, so the invitation is to, if you can, plant your feet on the ground. And as you plant your feet on the ground, perhaps feeling some uplift in the spine, Tuning into the breath, being here in this moment, letting the words we just heard wash over this entire community. And with the feet planted on the earth, really rooting down as if you're sending out roots. For this moment, we are a tree sending out roots into the center of the earth and feeling what Gaia has for us. She sends nutrients and lessons into those roots and letting that move up through our body. Feeling each one of us connected through the earth at this moment that we share through our hearts and through our connectedness to our expansive sky. And I turn it over to Tony to play for us and with us.
Thank you, Tommy. Incredibly powerful. Um, the more than can be said in words. Um, and thank you for bringing us into that space, Tony. Um, and to each of us, um, as we move into these breakout rooms, we'll do another um, too short discussion, but we will get to share with each other uh, just a couple minutes each, about four to five people in each room. And if you're on YouTube, you can feel free to journal um, and share what's coming up in the comments. Um, and as you just sit with what is coming up, sit with what's resonating for you. So putting, um, sitting with what's resonating for you and also sitting with, um, is there an action as an individual that I take that is connected to the collective? So perhaps there's a micro shift as we've talked about in each of these sessions that's becoming more clear. Um, so again, um, what's resonating for you? What has Gaia been teaching us? So moving into our breakouts, enjoy uh, your time together with four to five people. See you back here in about eight minutes.
Welcoming everybody back. We're just going to take about 30 more seconds to just roll into the Zoom rooms. If you're on YouTube, I hope you had a lively comment discussion. Um, if not, you're about to. <laughs> um, so as you come on back, um, as you just come back into the Zoom room or into the YouTube comments, um, you can start to just type in what came up for you. Um, perhaps you don't need to summarize the whole thing, but perhaps there was an essence statement. Perhaps there was um, something that just really struck you or stayed with you. And we'd love for you to share that in the chat and for us to be able to hear a few voices. Um, we have about 11 minutes left, so we'll keep it short, um, but we'd really love to hear from a few voices now. So if you'd like to share with your voice and video um, and you're in the Zoom room, you can, at the bottom of the screen, click on participants. On the right-hand side, you'll see a blue hand. If you'd like to share, we can bring your voice and video across. We've got Christopher and Alexander. Perfect. There we go. Um, yeah, it was really beautiful. Mm. Um, this is my dad. We're doing yep. this together. Um, but the meditation that you had about connecting with the tree and the roots and listening to what comes up, that was a big commonality in our group. Mm. And to really listen to the mother and listen what's coming through. Um, and it was quite touching because we were all men. So mm. it was sort of how to touch into that feminine aspect of us and mm. bring that through. It's very beautiful. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, it's so beautiful to hear that, um, that it was touching for you guys and, uh, and for that aspect of tapping into the masculine and feminine that lives within all of us. Um, we have another one, speaker. Cherry. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I'm muted. I'm going to assume that you can hear me, unless it's um, yeah. Um, in our group, I feel like this last session we were balancing um, awakening to how privilege works within our our lives in the group and how. Um, these realizations are helping people to see what it, what they really need, what they don't need, and how they can be of more service to others. And then a couple of us, and myself inclu included, balancing this anger at people just seeing things that are we are living, like my whole life I've been living, um, and people just now being open to see and act on the behalf to create change, um, balancing that with welcoming people to work together so you know and and someone summed that out is balancing ego and eco thank you thank you so much absolutely that balance um of ego and eco and moving towards um the collective in in variety of ways and what that requires of us to collaborate i think we have vince coming in next well, two quick things for the gentleman from Australia. The Art of Hosting Network is a place where I've learned to balance the masculine feminine a little bit better than I typically do. I didn't generally this, but I've now become this because of the art of hosting practices, which is very advantageous for all of you. Um, <clears throat> the big insight for me personally was I couldn't, I couldn't do any meditation or calmness because I'm so excited and I'm such a type A and I have so much action orientation and everything Capra, Fritjof of Capra, presented was extremely stimulating and uh i have a big initiative starting today called pivot19.org which is about taking action in this time collective network-based action for positive change and, and for healing and it's part of my recognition of my privilege but also part of being called to act in this moment 
Thank you for taking action. Thank you for sharing that energy, the vibrancy that we need um, to be moving. You know, as we sh lift out of this deep resonance, we need that spirit of taking action. Um, so thank you for that as well. Aya is next. Okay. Hi, everyone. I was feeling, um, you know, two emotions, like a yearning to make that happen, and then also a little uncertainty. And then my need was reassurance. By just opening up the discussion to the group of beautiful people from London, Chile, and in Brazil, gave me that reassurance that I was asking for. And then, you know, really mashing up into this uh, artful way ending with the poem and also the piano piece that um, Nelly was talking about was really wrapping up the way that we need to really listen deeply and then also from that place to engage in the action like a social entrepreneur or eco village that the team members are talking about so I just felt so uh, grateful for that connection and then that, that made me hopeful thank you Thank you for sharing that, Aya. We'll go to the last one, Heidi. Go ahead, Heidi. Yeah. Thank you. We were talking about the communication. What can we do to uh, make the people understand that going back to what was normal before is not the right way to do? And so when we come and tell them this, they won't listen. So we need uh, communication skills. We need to develop skills to, to, to have them understand by themselves where we could go, where they could go instead of just going backward. And for me, it's a big call to every one of us to learn these skills, to be able to talk with people without being a missionary, without being theoretical. And yeah, it's difficult. And I think we need to do some practice groups. Maybe we, you can offer those so far to me. Thank you, Heidi. Absolutely. And you know, it's a it's an evolving we are in this together. It's an evolving process. And, uh, and we keep moving into social solidarity circles, and hubs. So um, as you may have connected with people in this, uh, these zoom conversations, you can feel free to um, message each other directly and stay in touch. And uh, we'll talk more about how we do the hubs, etc. But right now, I'd love to hear and see Kelvi. Um, and what you have been working on this whole time, and I know you'll be continuing with us uh, later today as well, but over to you, Calvi, to take us through your image. Okay. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, I'm gonna stand not under the red, which, <laughs> um, So I had an impulse this week that I wanted to bring red into the drawing somehow. And like it came in a dream, but red is often associated with something, um, you know, the heart or painful. It's so layered with connotations. But what I loved today was how it could come in in service of life and in service of the new. So in a way we're used to associating green with something new, but I was thinking that it's the red coming in and it's through this reframing, this, this fundamental reframing of, of understanding these imbalances and looking into these imbalances and seeing them and sensing them and seeing the longer term view and the more systemic view and the more integrated view that we've been exploring for the past nine weeks to really like, like this is, this is a life or death time, right? And so like looking into these things a lot more boldly with a lot more courage than we've already been able to access in service of life is um, what I felt. And um, that's all. Thank you. Thank you so much. And what we'll do is we'll stay on the image now for a few moments. Um, and just hearing what Kelvi just said, but also seeing her image, if you can make it full screen for yourself, that would uh, probably help. And we'll just do a, a kind of condensed version of our visual resonance practice. So as you stay with this, um, writing into the chat 
uh, the chat Zoom, I see, I sense, or I feel. So we'll stay with this image for a moment and write in, I see, I sense, or I feel. I sense natural life. I feel connected. I feel confidence. I see life. I feel courage. I sense nature taking over. I see a river and a whale. I sense movement towards the light. I feel natural flow of the new innocent. I sense movement. I see the flow of water. I sense chaos organized. I sense freedom. I feel potential. Sorry, I feel potential and sense the flow towards new. Thank you all. Um, and thank you, Kelvi. And we will stay with you and you will stay with us through uh, the rest of our journey today as well. So thank you. Um, and thank you all for sharing all of these pieces. Um, Otto or Fritoff, do you have uh, any final words for us before we close today? Well, I have an invitation to everybody if you want to delve deeper into the systems view of life. Uh, please join the global network I've built up with my Capra course online. We now have 1,500 people from 70 countries around the world who are systemic thinkers and activists. And I teach this course twice a year in the spring and in the fall and uh, extend an invitation to you to join. It's capracourse.net, easy to find on the internet. And finally, thank you, Otto and Antoinette, for inviting me today. I really enjoyed that, and it was extremely inspiring. And thank you, uh, uh, Fritjof, uh, for, uh, for joining us. We'll make the, um, and providing your, um, your systems view lens uh, on the current situation that was eye-opening to many of us. And uh, we'll share the links that you just mentioned in the follow-on email that goes out. And I want to close with uh, uh, two things. So one uh, uh, comment that I picked up from the uh, chat, uh, Gaia, we mirror her. She has a fever and trouble breathing. That's the same symptoms as COVID-19. Wow. And um, the other one that I want to share is like the sense of fragility. So I picked up from the, um, uh, from the chat that um, some people so, so said, yes, but, you know, um, uh, universal basic income is really dead, the conversation in the U.S. and so on. So, so the sense of a profound fragility. So we are in a bifurcation points and things could go one way or the other. And it may depend on, um, you know, uh, on all of us really to doing our own piece to that. And that's really what, uh, what will be the focus as we uh, progress this journey. And thank you, uh, Fritja, for being part of it, for joining the conversation. Maybe also, I hope very much this is just the beginning that you will also uh, and you already indicated your your availability for that. Participate in some um, uh, future conversations. And one idea we one idea we already had is like that you suggested. In fact, is okay. So we have different sessions with Peter Sengi, yourself, uh, Umberto Maturana, Jimena, and then Julia. But you know, what about bringing all these people together the next time around, and you know, having a conversation? And that's uh, definitely an idea we'll pick up and probably make happen sometimes in fall or so. So with that, um, gratitude um, over to Antoinette.
Thank you. Thank you, Otto. Thank you, Fritaf. Thank you, everybody, uh, for joining us today. It has been such an amazing experience to just dive into um, the content that you shared, Fritaf, and um, and the the dialogue and conversation together. Um, really sensing into what's possible um, and the stories, these small stories that are starting to um, become alive as we um, feel into the learnings of Gaia. Um, it. I um, look forward to staying in touch. I know that many of us are already meeting in social solidarity circles and we will send out uh, 3.0. Um, if you're not already with us on you know, the email list to get that kind of content, feel free to, to do that. Um, you can find all of the essentials. So if you've missed any of the sessions um, or um, would like to see Peter's from this from earlier today um, or some of the others from later, um, that will come, they will all be up on GaiaJourney.org um, where you can find um, you can find all the information and make connections. You'll also be able to join into hubs and we've heard some really interesting initiatives that are already starting. Um, so you can feel free to start your own. And as we make this shift of moving from ego to eco, um, also looking at ways that we can collaborate with each other, that we can connect, um, and that we can maybe see that these ideas are actually merging together and that we can, um, can work together to make things happen across our regions and within them. Um, so thank you all. Thank you, everybody. We can unmute and say uh, goodbye, and we'll see you again quite soon. Take care, everyone. <laughs>